Hey guys, this interview that I did with Ellen Holloway is awesome and informative and in line with the church and hopefully going to improve your marriage, but it has content that is mature in nature. And so I'm going to give you a couple seconds to make sure you have your headphones in or you are not listening to this around the kiddos. Five, four, three, two, and one. So today I have an interview with Ellen Holloway, who is a Catholic sex and intimacy coach. And she has a, she's working on her master's degree in theology of the body. She has a certificate in secular, like some sort of sex therapy, which I'm sure was a wild certificate to get. She talks a little bit about that, but we go into all the things how sex in your marriage should be good, how you can work towards better sex in your marriage, theology, like theologically speaking, like the, how much of a sacrament it is and how many graces flow from being united physically and spiritually with your spouse. It's a really good, a really, really good talk. So I hope you enjoy it. Feel free to email me. If you have any questions, I can relay them to Ellen. And my email is holyhotmessmom at gmail.com. I have a bunch of them, but that's like the easiest one to remember. And uh, here we go. On with the show. Welcome to the Holy Hot Mess Podcast. I'm your host, Heather, and this is the podcast where we strive for holiness even when everything in the world and our personal lives can feel like it's a massive hot mess. From deep theological chats to simple practical advice, we talk about it all here all in hopes that we can encourage each other to keep our eyes, hearts, and minds set on heaven. Okay, I just wanted to pop in really quick and remind you that there is a giveaway on my Instagram. It's actually, you have to put in your name and your email address to enter the giveaway because a lot of people said they did not want to be liking and sharing a giveaway about spicy marriage intimacy stuff. It's PG stuff, but, well, no, I would not say PG, but you know what I mean. It's, it's holy things. And you can either go to the link in my bio at Holy Hot Mess Mom on Instagram, or I just put a direct link in the show notes to the show. So the giveaway ends on Monday the 15th, I think, (laughs) whatever that is. And um, yeah, go get yourself $500 worth of like awesome marital intimacy stuff. Oh, how are you? I am doing really well. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm really excited. Um, I think my husband's more excited for this. <laughs> he's Yay! like, he's like skipping around the house, like telling the kids, like everybody has to get showers. Mommy has a podcast interview. And I'm like, I bet That's you're excited. So important. <laughs> he said he's gonna get like a glass cup and like listen. <laughs> oh my gosh. So funny. It's cracking me up. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Everything started freezing and I was like, oh, the devil really does not want people to have like good holy sex. <laughs> I honestly like when I talk to other Catholic podcasters and I talk about like technical difficulties, they think that I am just inept at technology. And I'm like, I promise I am not inept at technology. I have had literally everything that could happen yeah. happen to it's wild well, actually that's not true and <laughs> oh my gosh lord like please continue to protect my technology um there are a lot worse things that could happen that could happen it's yeah just, like we have had some sort strength. of an issue yeah 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 okay um so i did a little intro that will go in the beginning of the podcast but can you just tell in your own words um tell everybody who you are um i mean what your journey is has been to like become this like Catholic sexpert. <laughs> I love that title <laughs> that you've given me. It's fantastic. I'm really, really good at nicknames. So if anybody ever needs a nickname, just let me know and I will I will I, come up with a good one for you. <laughs> I think I need to just roll with it. I love it. You should. Um, I think, I mean, like that would the Catholic sexpert, like that would be like it viral all over the place because all the atheists would be like, wait, what? Uh <laughs> Yes, oh exactly. My gosh. Well, yeah, I my name is Ellen Holloway. I am a Catholic sex and intimacy speaker and coach. Um, and I I was on a journey that got me here, um, which I think is similar to 
a lot of people's journey with sex and intimacy when it comes to like being Catholic and how do I integrate this? Mm -hmm. When my husband and I first got married, I mean, immediately we were at rock bottom, like two months in, we were just like, this sucks. Like what? Marriage is terrible. What is going on? And like, by the grace of God, we were able to pinpoint that um, we were in mortal sin when it came to using contraception. And that Mm -hmm. was the beginning of our journey in really understanding and integrating sexual intimacy and and seeing what really God's plan is for it and God's like the beauty that God has Mm -hmm. in store for it. And like how good it is. You know what I mean? Right. Like 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 evil makes it feel good when it's when it's illicitly done, right? But like how good it can be when it's done in a holy way. Exactly. Like, oh my gosh. That's that's well, like mind blowing. And just the the deep intimacy that comes from it. You know, I think a lot of times we use the word intimacy as like a code word for sex. Mm-hmm. And it's so much more than that. Like, yeah. Yes. And sex is a way of creating intimacy. Yes. And it's also a fruit of deep, good, and beautiful intimacy. Yes. And so I hate when people are like, oh, well, I, I was intimate with my husband last night. I'm like, I hope you were intimate with your husband two minutes ago. Like, All the you time. Should always, you yeah. should always be intimate with your husband. But that doesn't mean you should always be having sex with him. Uh, that yes. would be weird. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, and I think that was, um, you know, and I, I was hoping to, like, even talk about, like, go into this a little bit with you. I don't know how much time you have. But, um you know, my husband really came from like a purity culture Mm -hmm. and, um, his parents had him when he was really young. So it wasn't even necessarily moral purity culture. It was just practical. Like you don't want to have a kid when you're 16. Right. You know, like you don't want to eat government cheese. Right. You know, so therefore sex is bad. Anything else though, probably fine. Just don't do the sex kind of thing. Mm. But then it was like this very weird, we got engaged And three weeks later, we got married. My dad was deployed. So I didn't want to throw together a big wedding. And it was super weird because, like, that night, all of a sudden, everybody's like, so you guys, like, whose house are you staying at? Your parents or our parents? Because, like, he was in the Air Force. He was about to go to flight school. So, like, we didn't have a house or anything. We jumped into this. So we went home to two separate houses. Like, we got married and then, like, went to two separate houses. I think it was, like, two or three days later, we, like, got a hotel room. And so we had... I had not waited until marriage for him, but he had waited until marriage practically for me. And it was this very weird thing where like three days ago, sex was bad. Mm -hmm. And now sex is supposed to be good. And so like between my background of not having waited and his, it was like this weird dynamic of purity culture meets like, okay, but now sex is not bad. And it was very, Mm -hmm. it was just, I don't know, it was weird. So I, you know, and then you add in, we contracepted for for a while too, you know, before you realize the wrong of those things and all that, and it comes into it. But um, now I see like how good it can be when Mm -hmm. it's done within, like God gives us boundaries and parameters like to protect ourselves. And when you live within them, like it's so freeing. (laughs) It's so free. Right. Well, there's this Chestertonian image of like a really tall mountain with a plateau at the at the top. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine a group of kids with like a soccer ball playing at the top of this mountain. They'd be scared to death because there is this like cliff on the Mm -hmm. side. And they wouldn't be kicking the ball around because the ball would fall off, or maybe one of the kids would fall off. But then if you put a fence, if you put a border around this plateau area, now there is ultimate freedom of these Mm -hmm. kids playing soccer in this area because there's no concern of falling off the edge. There's no concern of the ball going away. Like, and, and there's just so much joy and freedom in that. And I, I think that that, that image, you know, G.K. Chesterton was talking about just faith as a, as a whole, right. All Mm -hmm. of the kind of rules and regulations of of our faith but like when you think about sex i think that is the perfect image for yeah. sexual intimacy is yeah. that we have these borders we have these like these bumpers you know you think about like mm-hmm. bowling right they put the bumpers up for the little kids like we are little kids yeah <laughs> we we don't understand the integration of our body and soul mm-hmm. 
in even the most minutia amount. We do not understand it. It is a mystery that is beyond human comprehension. Mm -hmm. And so God has given us these very clear boundaries so that we can utilize this gift of sex in a way that is good, true, and holy that allows us to connect with our spouse in a deeper and more intimate way and, and that it can both be a fruit of, of good, beautiful, intimate marital life as well as continue to grow that intimacy within our mm -hmm. marriage. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so do you, like in all of your study, because you're getting a master's degree in theology of the body, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. And you just finished a secular degree. I did. A secular I certificate. A certificate program. I just finished a secular, a very secular. <laughs> I know. I saw your and... reel on that and I was like, Ooh. the stuff <laughs> you were probably subject to. Huh. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I'll just like, just to give you a bit of a insight into it. I had to go through a, a couple hour module on kink affirming care. So, you know, that's I'm not gonna have video with this, but my jaw just <laughs> her jaw just dropped. She was like, oh, my jaw oh. just what? Oh my gosh. I well, can't even it was so good though, um, because it opened up some insight into me that I I used to recommend couples find a sex therapist. And I was like, just, just know your Catholic values. Like just know your Catholic mm -hmm. values and go see a sex therapist. And now I am extremely wary of saying that because there are so many minutia things that if you, if you're not like deeply ingrained and you yes. understand the severity of like some of these acts that like our secular culture is just like, guys, like you know, you and your spouse watching kind of like a little bit hotter of a movie together and getting aroused and going having sex. That's totally fine. Guys, that is so dangerous. It's so dangerous. Yeah. Like that. And that is not, you are using the persons that are in that movie in mm -hmm. order to grasp at sexual pleasure instead of connecting with your spouse in a deep community. Well, and then that way. sexual pleasure that you do have with your spouse is almost superficial mm -hmm. in that way, you know, because exactly. it's manufactured, it's not mm -hmm. authentic. Mm -hmm. And um, I have that, like, I have said this to my husband, and I'm going to say this out loud for whoever is listening. <laughs> um, but I have this like image, like I told him, like when we really started, like really being more intimate in all ways, shapes, ways, shapes, and forms. And, and he was always the one who wanted it always a lot more than I did. But then like, I then wanted it more. Like I, I realized that I was not getting spiritual intimacy, communicative in intimacy, mental, physical, emotional. And then I felt like we were roommates who occasionally had sex. And that was really hard for me, but then he wanted to have sex more often, you know? Well, we like came together one time <laughs> and afterwards I was like, I thought I was a weirdo, but I was like, I think that's a foretaste of heaven. And he was like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, I have fully given myself to you, bare bones, everything. And you've fully given yourself to me. And at that exact moment, there is no pain. There is nothing wrong in the world. Like that exact moment. And I said, what if that moment is what eternity feels like? And he was like, I don't know. It's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, I kind of think of it that way because if you equate it, it's like our marriage is a foretaste of heaven, right? Mm -hmm. Our marriage, the, the marital act coming together is mimics the Eucharist, right? That's the consummation of those vows and the Eucharist. And so it's like, I don't know, to me, that made it like an offering to each other. You know Absolutely. what I mean? Like it just makes Absolutely. it so much more meaningful than when we first got married and it was just two like bodies slopping together for pleasure. I, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it, and so, yeah. Um, so that blows my mind. I mean, the, it was hard enough for me to go through normal therapy that was not Catholic in nature. Mm -hmm. Um, I found a therapist who was eventually wonderful and amazing and exactly what I needed, but she was such a good therapist. You had no clue where she stood on anything. And she followed my lead regarding faith and things like that. Um, very well. Whereas like I had been to other ones before who were like, 
they would just flat out tell you to go do something sinful. You know what I mean? Like they just didn't care. And so yeah. I can only imagine you gotta in be the careful. sex therapy careful realm. Course. Yeah. Oh gosh. It's bad. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what, what exactly do you do for people with like coaching and things like that? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I, I went on this journey. I was definitely affected by purity culture. I just had these blinders up, right? Sex mm-hmm. was bad and dirty. And it's yeah. just something that like, once you get married, then it's like, I guess, okay, then it's not, but, but it's still yeah. not like good. It's still, but like, like don't talk about it. Anything. Never yeah, talk, talk about, about it. it. <laughs> Um, and then pretend like you didn't do the thing to make all these babies. Like, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh my yeah. gosh. Not to get off topic here, but I remember seeing this real several years ago, actually it, it circles around every once in a while of like this. I want to say she's just like non-denominational Christian, or maybe she's Mormon even. Um, and she has like eight or nine kids and it's her like dancing around pregnant, but it's like when like, when you realize that you telling your parents that you're pregnant, like you're telling your parents that you've had sex. And I'm like, well, duh, because sex is the most beautiful thing <laughs> yeah. ever. Of course you and your husband should be That's having sex. That's how you solidify your, your vows. Yes. Like, it's a good and thing. like, if you're she's not, like all then there's like a problem. I know. Oh my gosh. My yeah. mother-in-law has said before, like, I still wonder how you guys made those four kids. And I always joke and say, well, we've had sex at least four times or three times because we have twins. So <laughs> I'm like, we've done it at least three, twi- three times. Maybe just three, yeah. Yeah. Um, but but I'm like, what do you, you know, my mom, she, my mom follows me on Instagram. And in the past year, I've really been like deep diving biblical submission in the holiest possible ways, right? Mm-hmm. Um, diving into like femininity, good sexual health for a marriage, right? Like all these mm-hmm. things that I'm seeing growth and peace and joy, and just like abundance in those areas. So I talk about them on Instagram and my mom's like, La 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 la. I'm covering my ears and I'm like, mom, like you two should be having good sex. Like you're, you know what I mean? Like, and I was like, also, I'm 36. Like, what do you think I do? Okay, guys, first ad break is Mentionables. That is a model free lingerie company. We love them here. They're great to work with. And if you use my code, Holy Hot Mess, you get 10% off your order. I love them because. I am not a size zero. I got a little junk in the trunk and they fit me wonderfully. I feel beautiful. They're flattering, really high quality, not super expensive. And their website is not full of basically pornography. (laughs) So I can send them a link to them to my husband and say like, hey, pick something out for Valentine's Day. Or he can just go on there whenever he wants. And he knows that he's not going to be looking at basically naked women. And I know that he's going to be not looking at basically naked women and everybody wins. I really love mentionables. They've got like little nighties, they've got undies, they've got little jammies, and then they have like some saucier stuff that is lovely. So go ahead and go to shopmentionables.com and use code holy hot mess. Pod gets a little cut back and you're supporting the pod and your marriage life. So what I really do, I, I went on this journey from, from purity culture to now this true understanding of the beauty mm-hmm. of sexual intimacy. And I mean, it's a journey I'm absolutely still on. This is never something I don't that think it ends. anybody arrives at. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that is the journey that I help Catholic women on is just this journey of integrating the goodness, the truth, the beauty of sexual intimacy, whether that comes from a purity culture mm-hmm. background of like sex is bad and now I have to flip this light switch, or if that comes from a super promiscuous a, background, yeah, a promiscuous, right? As from yes. a promiscuous background where it's still like, okay, but you still have to reconcile the exact same thing that sex mm-hmm. is good and holy, right? Yeah. That it's yeah. not just this animalistic urge that we have as humans yeah. that we cannot control. Yes. Like, yes, we absolutely can control. That's the human journey is learning to like control our urges so that we can point them in the right direction and allow them to lead us to heaven. Yes. Yeah. Like you were talking about how sex, you know, is a foretaste of heaven. I mean, and that is absolute gospel truth right there. Like that. Well, I mean, biblical truth gospel. Yes. But like Genesis, (laughs) that is, that is Genesis truth right Mm -hmm. there. And that's what 
the theology of the body really digs into is like, it's basically like a Bible study on Genesis okay, and understanding what it means to be created in the image and likeness of God as male and female. Mm-hmm. When husband and wife come together in the marital act, we are imaging God. We are imaging the communion of the Trinity. So, okay, sorry. I'm thinking, do, do you, <laughs> what time do you need to be off this? Because um, might make this a two-parter. So here I am thinking like, okay, if man and woman are made in the image and likeness of God, God is one, but we are two. Then the God true, three, well, well, yes, but one, one yes, one, one, the He's a divinity, communion of persons. The communion of persons. <laughs> You know, that God is the the Trinity, right? Mm -hmm. So the true foretaste of that divinity that we are invited into as Christians because we've been adopted by God, the truest form of that is unity Mm -hmm. between man and woman. And so how warped is that that Satan can take that? Well, I'll pause you right there just okay. to not get uh, heretical. Okay, good. Okay. We'll just yes, correct me. The truest form of that is our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay. Yes. Because, I mean, there's, there's and, consecrated and like marriage, women and things like that. Yes. Okay. Marriage is an image of that relationship with Jesus Christ. So let me give you a couple of images. Okay. All right. So one of the ways that you can explain the Trinity is mm-hmm. God the Father, mm-hmm. the Father, gave the gift of love to God, the son, Jesus, Mm -hmm. and the son perfectly received that gift. Okay. And the Holy spirit is that love that circulates, right? So the father gave the gift. He initiated the gift. Okay. The son perfectly received that gift. Okay. And in receiving that gift became a gift, a perfect gift of himself, fully giving himself back to the father. So there is this circular nature nature of Mm -hmm. it. And the Holy spirit is that love that is circulating between Mm -hmm. the two. Okay. Now I'll give you another image. Jesus Christ on the cross initiated the gift. He gave himself fully to his bride, the church. Okay. And Mary at the foot of the cross perfectly accepted that gift. And in accepting that Mm -hmm. gift became a gift herself, became a perfect gift herself. And Mary offering is it back. Mary, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she offered it back. Right. So we have that same image there, right? We have, so we have the image of God, the father initiating mm-hmm. God, the son receiving, right. Then okay. when we take it a step down, we go, Jesus mm-hmm. gave, he initiated the gift to humanity and humanity and Mary re- perfectly received that gift. So we have that same image of that spy reading love. Mm-hmm. Now we take it a step down again mm-hmm. and we go to marriage. Okay. Within marriage, mm-hmm. the man images God mm-hmm. and the woman images all of humanity. So we're looking at what happened on the cross. Uh, Venerable Fulton Sheen, mm-hmm. he, he is uh, known for saying, you know, what what is happening at the foot of the cross? Nuptials. Nuptials is happening oh, at wow. the foot of the cross. It is a marriage. It is a marriage of uh, Christ to his bride, the church. Man and woman are imaging that marriage, are imaging what happened at the cross Mm -hmm. within their marriages. The man is the initiator in the gift. If we think biologically, he is the one who gives first. Yes. And we receive. Yes. And the woman physically receives. The biological informs the the theological. Yes. So then the woman in receiving that becomes now let's talk about like the most ultimate form of sex the most ultimate form of sex is when a baby is is created uh, consummated right mm-hmm. and and it's not saying that like sex without uh consummation isn't sex like it's just that that's the most it's the most unitative it. like it's like right. that's just the like that's when the glue sticks <laughs> is that, sure yeah that's a good way to say it <laughs> right, but, like, the most in, unitive. yes in the woman receiving in the woman, like fully receiving this gift of the sperm, she then becomes a massive gift herself in giving up her body Mm. for another, right? This is my body given up for you. This is my body given up for you, right? So in that, and so that's an image of that perfect reception. Now we have to be so careful with these images to not like 
place them on top of God. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. these images are informing our understanding. Because but we'll like, never comprehend it. Like we're just exactly. not going to. Exactly. So no attempt at being heretical or anything. Just my little brain trying to be like, wait a minute. Like <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. But if we go back to just husband and wife, even mm-hmm. without the consummation, right? So we have husband is that like biological initiator of the gift, right? Mm-hmm. Woman is that biological receiver of the gift. Yeah. But in that biological giving and receiving, there is then this more spiritual receiving and giving in the woman receiving the man. Mm-hmm. Um, she then becomes a gift to her husband, a gift of herself, a gift of her body. Yeah. Um, and then the husband then receives that gift Yeah. and then gives it back. So we have, again, so we have the same circular Mm -hmm. giving and receiving so that's what's happening when you have sex with your husband I what and and like I know and it's just hard because people get so like like icky about sex you know I just recently got back from um the seek Seek 24 conference I I had so many conversations (laughs) with women about sex Good. That's your job. (laughs) I just had some, I had some beautiful conversations of just like some opening up some truths that was just like, I've never, I've Mm -hmm. never even comprehended that. And then, but then I had a lot of conversations of just like, I would start talking and it was just mortified. I mean, just these women were mortified. Their faces turned bright red. They kind of like ran off. They like took my little flyer thing and ran off. They're like, I don't even want to. You know, and it's like, oh, the, you, I need to reach, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to off. talk to you. You're the one I need to talk to. Um, I So the, one of the whole reasons why I started this podcast, and I mean, my listeners have heard it before, so I'm not going to like go into it, was I realized the Eucharist was true. And I had tried to use God to get my way, and he used my stupidity to bring me on around. And then he used my <laughs> obsessive, like, ADHD that I started reading everything. Mm. And I I had those moments where it was, and I'm, I know that you're going to relate to this where you just go, if everybody knew what I knew, the whole world would change. Right. Yep. And so I feel like I'm doing this with sex and marriage and intimacy and biblical submission and all these things. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. If everybody knew what I knew, families would be built up. People would be happy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Everything would be rightly ordered. And so like, I think that's why, you know, this podcast has just been a labor of love for five years. And, and I just trust the Lord that like, I'm not supposed to be this big wig. I'm not supposed to have this huge following, but the Lord has told me multiple times, like whoever needs to hear whatever you're saying, will hear it. Even if it's only one person, keep doing it, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, this podcast has been the one that I have gotten significant amount of like ask this question do like I'm curious about this and it's I think especially me I don't know how long how long have you been married uh about seven years okay so we're 12 years in and most of the marriages around us are crumbling you know and um and that's not to say that our marriage has not suffered like horrible hardship and distrust or or any of the things that every marriage goes through in one way shape or form but like there was a moment where I just had to be like okay the options are like quitting or fighting for your marriage and I don't want to be around anybody who doesn't want me to fight for my marriage ever period come what come what may sickness health like whatever like I'm following these vows and like I will be damned (laughs) you know like like this is a sacrament (laughs) And uh, the Lord ordains it. And this is the man the Lord ordained me to be with. And I I will, like, I'm not going to my grave going, well, we laughed a lot and we were roommates that had sex occasionally. Like, I was like, no, like that, like there's, you know, there were some yeah. things that were brought up that we were like, this is lacking in our marriage. And I, and I was like, then we gonna fix it, you know? Um, yeah. And so I, I do wish, and I, I think normally I speak to people who are probably in their thirties to early to mid forties. Um, that might need to hear this, but it's also one of those things where it's like, oh man, if I could go back and tell somebody who is engaged or is about to get married, some of the things I've learned about marriage and about sex and intimacy, it's one of those like big sister Titus two moments where you're like, 
let me show you the wisdom I have kind of yeah. thing. And so I love that you're doing that. And I love that you went to seek like, that's awesome. Yeah, because... I was trying to reach, I was trying to reach the girls before they're even engaged. Right. Yes. Like yeah. they're like dating right now. Or some of them are like, I am so single. It's not even funny. Like I heard that so yes, many times. And it's, and that's good. <laughs> and, and I'm like, that's fine. Let me give you, I created this little, it's just like, it was a super simple free download mm -hmm. and it was seven lies about sex that every girl is told. I'll put a link and to it. <laughs> I just, yeah, please. Like, it's just, it's just good truth to like share with any young women or even like if you're married read through them make yeah. sure you don't believe any of those yeah <laughs> okay you so do... oh, sorry about that <laughs> it's okay I, like, camera was a little shaky under me. Oh, it's okay gosh. I am on a like a breakfast tray sitting on my bed <laughs> so it's fine it's totally fine um okay so one of the questions I had on here um was what do you think the biggest misconception Catholics, specifically Catholic women, have about sex is then? If you're, you got your oh, seven man. lies, you have two? I have, okay. I have two. I'm going to give two. Okay. Because I think they come from two different spots. Okay. So I think the biggest, probably number one, mm -hmm. would be just this total misunderstanding of like the point of sex. Like there is this idea that like sex is just something that my husband needs and if we want to have kids I have to do like and then I and I have to just like give it to my husband and like mm -hmm. and that will play it's a box him. I have to like, check him happy it's a box and I keep him from cheating on me exactly that's yeah oh gosh so or using I'm a military yeah see yeah, yeah. so I'm a military blah, blah, wife blah. and so a lot of that that's a, there's a lot of that just in the military circles. It's like, you have to do these X, Y, Z things because if you don't, he's going to go somewhere else. And it's like, can we please stop telling women that like they are picking better men than this? Like, please hold the men to higher standards than this. You know, anyways. Okay. So that lie. So that lie, which like, I mean, honestly, I'm not going to try to like combat it right now. Cause it's like such a big, mm -hmm. go listen to my podcast, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and then the other one that I think I see a lot is that like, which is, I, I mean, it's very similar to this one, but is just this whole concept of that sex is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and that sex is like an embarrassment, which I like, I recognize they're similar, but I, I, when I coach women, they're actually two really different mental blocks Yes, is like this checkbox issue with sex mm -hmm. of like, I just have to do it to mm -hmm. like keep our marriage together and like keep my husband happy. Mm -hmm. And then there's this, like, I actually think that sex is dirty. I actually yes. think that sex is bad. Yeah. I'm going to give you one more. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> It's okay. You asked for the number one. I'm like, here's the top three. No, I have like, you're saying things and I have other questions that, and I'm like, okay, we're asking this one. So I have it on my phone right now. So when I look down, Perfect. it's because I'm like looking at all the questions. Okay. Third no, one. It's all good. <laughs> um, is that once you get married, anything goes. And that's not true. Like that image I talked about earlier of the Chestertonian image of like this tall mountain with like borders yeah. around it. God has placed natural law on us as humans um and basically what that means is that we have to look at the nature oh, this of what something is for mm -hmm. and um and like allow that to be a, like recognize what something is for how it was designed and then work yes. within that design and so that's like that's the thing with contraception big one but then like Further than that, things like uh, a man ejaculating outside of the woman, that's mm -hmm. not licit. Um, yeah. And like hand jobs, blow jobs, like again, all of those having to do, and there's, there's minutia to it. And I have a couple of podcast episodes that really just dive into like okay. what's licit and illicit. Good. Um, okay. Okay. If, if people want to listen to those, they're like the December 25th and January 1st of like 2023 and then 2024. So, Oh, so you just did those? Well, they were actually, I rerun some podcast episodes. Oh, okay. Smart, smart. They Maybe were, I should do that. Yeah. 
Um, they were some of the most popular I had. They were back in like 2022. Okay. Um, but I had my friend Sarah Bartell on, who's a moral theologian, and we just oh, ran through all right. um, those, some of those top things. So nice. um, go take a look at those if you're kind of like, wait, is anything okay? Because that yeah. would take up like three hours if we like went. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. So one person, and you had just said this regarding the checkbox situation. Mm -hmm. Um, someone asked, would you recommend scheduling sexy time on the calendar to make it a priority for a couple? Oh my I have gosh. thoughts on this. Absolutely. You... Oh, so absolutely. you say absolutely. See... Absolutely. Okay. Hold on. Here's, so here's the you, thing. You talk for a second. My Zoom is telling me that my free minutes are almost up. So I'm gonna go handle that for a second while you chat. So when I'm when I look distracted, it's because I am. But um no worries. <laughs> okay, so you tell us why you say that people should do that. All right. So we prioritize things that okay. are important. That, okay. Very we, true. We schedule mass, even if it's not written on our calendar, we schedule it. We mm -hmm. make sure that we go to mass every Sunday because that is a priority. Mm -hmm. We schedule prayer time because that is a priority. We say, yes. I'm going to pray every morning at seven o'clock before the kids get up or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. We schedule going to work like that we because that is a priority we have that in our schedule i leave yeah. at 7 30 in the morning to get to work on time mm -hmm. these things are scheduled even though they're not you know written down in our yes. calendar right mm -hmm. but they are they're, scheduled in yes. our life sex is a priority or it should be if it's not mm -hmm. scheduling sex does not mean putting it on a list i i made this real a couple couple of months ago and it was like <laughs> so popular but I was just like what people think I mean when I say scheduling sex and I just wrote out this like checklist of like okay I just watched that dishes, yesterday do yes. dishes like um right you know um do the laundry like mm -hmm. and like I wrote down like the grossest chores that we have to do and then I wrote like sex under it right that is not what scheduling sex means. Okay. Scheduling sex means this is so important to me that I am going to make sure to mentally prepare and give myself a break earlier in the day so that I have enough energy for my husband later tonight when we've said that we want to come together and have sex. Scheduling sex means I'm going to prioritize putting some time into making this really awesome for my husband or for my wife. If there's a, a there's a yeah. man listening, right? I'm scheduling, even if you don't schedule it together, like if you just schedule it on your own and like, I think I want to have sex tonight with my husband. That means I'm going to like clean up the bedroom a little bit. I'm going to mm -hmm. like put some candles out. I'm going to pick a playlist. I'm going to put a playlist together. Like that's all part of scheduling sex. We have this like terrible misunderstanding of what scheduling sex means. Mm -hmm. Like Spontaneity. Okay. I have a podcast episode from a couple of months ago. I keep just, it's okay. It's called spontaneity is crap. Because okay. Spontaneity <laughs> is absolute crap. Yes. If you, I'm sorry, do you spontaneously buy a house? Yeah. Do you spontaneously just like decide to have a deep and intimate prayer life with God? Do you, no, you do not spontaneously do anything that is important. Sex yeah. is vitally important. Yeah. And just because you've scheduled sex doesn't mean that like, if you guys are in the mood one night that you like, didn't can't. already think about it, that doesn't mean you can't. Yeah. Yes. Like, that's fine. Right. Um, but scheduling sex means putting it as a priority in your life and making sure that you are mentally like giving yourself the, the buildup that you need, because like a lot of women, we need a lot of buildup before yes. we're ready for sex. And like, if you can prepare throughout the day and be thinking like, oh my gosh, like I'm really looking forward to this. I'm excited about this. Maybe you like send a text to your husband in the middle of the day, like, hey, like I'm going to wear that about green you. one tonight, yes. you know, right? Like, and you like, t you know, I'm thinking about you. Oh, I'm really excited. Like once the kids go to bed tonight, like I'm, I'm looking forward to tonight, right? And you just like, you build up that excitement and you, you put effort toward it. Mm -hmm. then your sex life can only get better. Yes. If you schedule sex in a way that it's like, we have to do this because it's time to do it because it's been three days, then your sex life is going to suffer. Okay. So that when but like, you if you do that with prayer, then your prayer life is going to suffer. Yes. Like, uh, yeah. 
And we went through like a period where I had, I had asked him like how frequent would, would, do you think would be adequate? Right. Mm -hmm. Because I just honestly, if, if I didn't schedule it, I didn't care to like just, Mm -hmm. and I know a lot of it was hormones. A lot of it was just our overall communication and intimacy. And I know that now. I want to circle back to that sentence you just said about a lot of it was hormones because that's also crap, but no, we'll circle back. it actually was. It was after having twins. I had four kids in four years and I had zero sex hormones. It was actually yeah, tested. So, you're, so, so your hormones actually have very little to That's do right. I read that you put that. Yes. So I think my hormones made me exhausted and the exhaustion made me have zero interest. Um, yeah. Is honestly probably a more adequate statement for that. Um, so it's in the in the cycle, but not direct cause and effect. Because when we did it I didn't have any problems you know what I mean Mm -hmm. like it was it was just that I didn't want to do it because I was tired or whatever it was and I I've always said there's three things I never regret doing and it's going to mass ever like even if you Mm -hmm. like begrudgingly and working out that's always like that you always feel better right even if it's a bad workout you're still like you know what Mm -hmm. I did that and that was good for me and having sex with my husband like I never regret that. And so that was one of the things where like, he was like, okay, I'd like, you know, every three to four days. And I literally was like, it's day three, it's day four. And it, he looked at me one day and he's like, I really like, I love you and I will do it whenever you want to do it. But I can tell you're checking a box and it hurts my feelings, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't think he said those exact words, but that was a gist of it, you know? And, mm-hmm. and so when, when I said that question and you immediately said like, yes, schedule it, I was like, oh God, no, don't schedule it, you know? But it's because we were coming at it from two different angles, right? Mm-hmm. You're saying you put things, you make a plan for things in your life that are important because, mm-hmm. you know, time is money and money is whatever the phrase is whatever you spend money right on things that are important to you. So where you're spending your money shows what things are important to you and where you're Mm -hmm. spending time even more shows even more the things that are important to you. And so like in this hierarchy of like, God comes first, I need to take care of my own self too, in a non-selfish way. And then the next priority needs to be my husband and then the children. And so if I am not actively making a time commitment priority to my husband, then he's not actually a priority. Mm-hmm. So then what's, what's going to happen when the kids leave, you know? And um, exactly. I think that was a, that was a wake up call to me. It was like, okay, we have to work on communication and all these things because those are the things I need to make being actually together a priority because mm-hmm. I can't just turn it on and off like he can, you know? Um, I can't have a t- horrible day and be yelling at my kids and then turn around and be like, hey, <laughs> it just doesn't right. work that way. Um, exactly. And so well, the other thing that the mm-hmm. other thing that can happen when a husband and wife actually like kind of schedule sex together is and, and what I mean by scheduling sex is like it, it's again, it's making it a priority. Right. So mm-hmm. if it's like if you say we're going to do it on Tuesday and like Tuesday actually ends up being a really awful day. Well, don't like don't force yourself because then you're checking it, a box. Right? Yes. Like then you're just checking a box. Right. But if a husband and wife are like, OK like, yeah, to like, let's, let's do it on Tuesday. And you can take a look at Tuesday and go, well, Tuesday is when, you know, Haley has soccer practice and, yeah. um, and that's the day that, you know, this happens and when we get home I'm really also going to have that appointment. Right. And so it's like, now you guys can put a plan together of like, okay, well, let's make sure that we take a couple of things off of your plate as mm-hmm. the, as the wife, because typically, I mean, more often than not kind of uh, the wife is of a more responsive desire. The man is of a more spontaneous desire. So mm-hmm. it's a little harder for the woman to get into the mood for sex. She needs more buildup. She needs more time. She needs more um, stress relief. She mm-hmm. needs more energy. Yes. So, so take some things off of your plate that day, mm-hmm. like allow yourself, right? Like, okay. Like, well, you know, normally I try to cook dinner on Tuesday, even though it's a really busy day, but like, let's go grab takeout that night. So mm-hmm. that I can now, I can now take that mental energy and put it toward getting excited for having sex with my husband, mm-hmm. um, instead of like trying not to burn everything while yes. five kids are running around, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then my husband's mind is on one thing, and I'm like, I'm trying to not 
burn everything, you know, exactly. Yes, absolutely. Okay, y'all, ad break number two is the affiliate Coco New. They are an organic natural intimacy product. So they sell lubricants and oils and even like a little personal massager that you can use in creative ways. And um, funny story, we actually found Coco New because about a year or so ago, I used um, some lubricant and had a horrible allergic reaction to it. And then couldn't walk normally for like three days. So we went on the hunt for something like natural, organic, um, not coming from a website that's like erotica. It's literally just like these little intimacy products and that's it. Nice and clean, healthy for me, healthy for him, and we love them. So if you go to coconu.com, that's C-O-C-O-N-U.com and use code Holy Hot Mess, you get 15% off your order. Okay. Do you have, like, what is your background with NFP? Do you do anything regarding NFP? Yeah, so because I have a few I, questions regarding it, but I was like, you know what? I could always reach out to somebody who's like an NFP expert if that's not your like cup of tea, but. I would absolutely say that I'm an NFP expert. Um, oh, I okay, used to be a Simto Pro instructor. Um, okay, I so perfect. Let These are good. Lapse in order to um, pursue this stuff. Yeah. Um, but the okay. podcast actually started as an NFP podcast. Oh, okay. Oh, so your Instagram handle, I figured I was like, it's pretty. Um, okay. So I have a few questions. Um, one person asked NFP makes trying to avoid really hard. How does a couple have good active, have a good active sex life when only using phase three? It is so much more difficult to achieve an orgasm and feel in the mood at that time of the month. There are so few days we can actually be physically intimate and they are when I'm least interested. What advice do you have for this to be less of a burden? And this kind of flows into another question that I have after. Yeah. Okay. So there's, there's a couple of things here is one, I want to talk about uh, stress response and sexual interest. Okay. Your stress is the number one indicator of your interest in sex because sex is not a survival instinct. Mm. If you are stressed, interest for sex goes away. Now, the opposite is there for men. For men, sex is a survival instinct because oh, they're trying man. to continue the population. Yes, for so women, I die off my population so so Right. But for women, it is not a survival instinct because when a woman gets pregnant, she cannot take care of herself. Yes. So a woman has to, or I mean, she can't, but like yes. she needs yeah, more yeah. assistance, right? To take care right. of her. Right. Yeah. You basically so have to go, woman, you should go dormant, right? Like that's exactly, yeah. exactly. So when a woman is stressed, sex, desire for sex almost completely goes away. Because you are now in survival mode as soon as you get even the minor like amount of stress yeah. in your yeah. life. And as if you are a working mom, if you are a stay at home mom, if you are a, a adult living in 2024, like <laughs> you're stressed. Um, you're stressed. Yeah. Um, so you have to look at what is causing you stress. Mm -hmm. The number one thing I say to my one-on-one -on -one clients who come to me and say, I have like no libido is I say, okay, get eight hours of sleep every day for the next 30 days and then come talk to me. Figure out your stress. Yeah. It's crazy. That I'm you not say that. kidding. Like your sleep is your sleep yeah. is the number two indicator. Yeah. So stress, stress is number one. Sleep. sleep is number two. This is why actually the hormones, progesterone, estrogen, those actually have nothing to do with libido in women. We always say we always say that like, um, oh, I'm, I, I have a higher libido during my phase two. Here's why. Here's why you feel like you have a higher libido. Estrogen mm -hmm. is an upper. Estrogen increases your energy. You have mm -hmm. a little bit more energy during phase three. Your libido is down here at level one. You have a level one libido. When your estrogen is, is low, which phase three, your estrogen is almost zero. Mm -hmm. That level one libido is there, there's nothing, you, you can't help it, right? Mm -hmm. But when your estrogen rises, your energy rises, which takes some of that stress away. Mm -hmm. So now that level one libido that you have, 
feels higher, even though it hasn't changed at all. Okay. But your stress has gone down a little bit. Okay. And so now your stress is like just under the cusp of your, your level one libido, right? So, so we need to work on sleep and we need to work on stress. Yeah. And then you will actually find that you will have desire for mm -hmm. sex in that phase three. And it will, it will be of interest to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, so I will. Oh yeah. yeah go ahead. No. So, so when I had gone through trauma therapy, it's crazy that you say that because the number one, the reason why I went through it was because a functional medicine practitioner said, I cannot help you at all until you get your stress under control. And I literally looked at her and I was like, I live with my stress, homie. Like, what do you want me to do? And she was like, no, no, no. You have to get to the root cause of it because mm -hmm. life is always going to be stressful. If you can't handle that, then like you're, you're never going to be okay. Um, mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I graduated trauma therapy completely done February of 2023. And saw a big uptick in my libido and then yes! we moved and then we moved internationally <laughs> with the military and it was like decently stagnant but it, it didn't drop and it's because I learned how to handle my stress mm -hmm. yes and and so that's interesting and what, what you said about men too it's wild because we will be going through the most stressful thing and that's all he wants and that's I'm like he wants get to away sex. from me that it's a survival instinct my mind I love it that's yeah. really fascinating. Yeah. Oh but my gosh. Here's, here's the okay. thing. Cause I think a lot of women are like, oh my gosh, my husband wants to have sex like at the most inopportune times. <laughs> yeah. And like, here's the thing is we can actually, we can actually really thank God for that. Yeah. Because sex is kind of like, it, it serves these two purposes in marriage. It is a fruit of a deeply intimate relationship, mm -hmm. but it also creates a bonding effect and can help to clear, like it, it, it is a stress reliever. Reliever, and yes. It it bonds husband and wife together. So like if you're kind of on rocky ground, it can like it can help bond you chemically yes. together so that you Ooh. can like interact better, right? So it it, it serves these two purposes in marriage. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when your husband wants to have sex and it's like it's a rocky time of life right now. Because he needs As you. a woman, we shouldn't immediately just like write it off. No, yeah. you should never say yes to sex if you really don't want to have sex. Like it, yeah. that, that's wrong. Yeah. Um, however, if your husband, your husband is not asking for sex simply to be annoying to you. I can guarantee you that. Yeah. Right? He genuinely wants to connect with you on a deeply intimate level to subconsciously, Finally. he's trying to reduce your stress and help connect and bond you two together. This is all subconscious. He's trying to connect and bond you two together yeah. so that you can work through this better. So a lot of times in those instances, again, if it's kind of like how they always want to have sex whenever you have a headache. Yep. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. He's subconsciously trying to make things better for you. Now, sometimes you can't muster up the energy and that is okay. You can always, you always should have the freedom to say no to sex. You yeah. should never feel forced to have sex with your husband. But I think sometimes even just that slight mindset shift, mind, mindset shift <laughs> of like, my husband is doing this to help our relationship and help me feel better. Yeah. That can be enough to help us be open to the possibility of having sex yeah. and, and increasing that intimacy. Okay. Um, Okay. That's awesome. Okay. So just to remind everybody, this question started out about <laughs> NFP about and trying basic. to avoid oh, yeah. phase Actually, three. I feel like I no. haven't quite answered And it. that's okay because that was really, like, it's still really, really good information. So it's totally okay. I just wanted to remind people. Um, okay. What do you have? Okay. No, you did answer. What advice do you have for this to be less of a burden? Reduce mm. your stress levels and communicate yeah. that way. I think my big takeaway from like everything I've learned is like, you have got to communicate with your husband. Yep. You have to be intimate in speech, intimate in word, actions. Um, you need to laugh with each other, but the amount of times we have let ourselves slip into roommates who occasionally have sex with each other, 
I have just realized that I'm, I won't stand for it anymore. And it's, I know that it's primarily my fault because I'm not a physical touch person and I get overwhelmed and then it becomes this, you know, just going through the motions of everything. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I start feeling that when he comes over and smacks me on the butt that I'm like, ugh, get away from me. That is my cue that we've been living like roommates and I need to fix it. Yeah. And so for me, if I, not somebody who's an expert in NFP at all, um, when I read that, what that says to me is that you're not being intimate month round in all the other ways you should be being intimate. And yes. you really have to intentionally foster that intimacy. And that does not necessarily mean watching Netflix shows with each other. You know what I mean? Ooh. Like that's having big, deep conversations and praying together. Right. Oh um, yeah. That's a big one. Praying go, together. Go to confession together. Mm -hmm. I think during, during that, um, peak you know, window that, that mm -hmm. phase two, depending on what method you're using, method you're going to call it yeah. something else, that fertile window, mm -hmm. go to confession together. Like yeah. that's such a good thing to the grace to, that comes from that. Yeah. To just come into contact with God's grace at a moment, especially if it's really hard for you and your husband to keep avoid your hands off each other that time. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe if it's like, even if maybe it's easy for you, but difficult for your husband, like mm -hmm. go to confession together during that time. Yeah. And I, as you say that, I even think receive the Eucharist as Absolutely. much as possible during that phase too, because then you are united mm -hmm. through the Eucharist. Right. And, and on a, on a mystical level that we, again, we can't comprehend. Yeah. You are more united to your husband when you go to mass together and receive the Eucharist mm -hmm. than you are when you have sex. Like and there's more unity there. Yeah. So we, like our parish in Louisiana, um, there's also they, more fertility there. Sorry. Oh no, it's okay. Um, the parish in Louisiana that we went to, they started, kneeling um like at a like a little mini altar rail that they kind of had put uh -huh. in during 2020 and our priest invited the families to go up and so instead of receiving like at a latin mass where it's like all these people rapid fire on a altar rail mm -hmm. or at typical no novus ordo where you're you know one one by one the families would walk up and all kneel together and like those moments right there i was like oh my gosh like we're all receiving, you know what I mean? We're all receiving this yeah. together. And that a really cool practice for um married couples, like if you're um at kind of that typical like lineup one in a row, is once it gets to your turn, is go stand side by side, you know, put your hands out and then receive at the same time. So wait, you know, wait if, to if, consume. If put in your hands first, mm. wait for your spouse to get it and then consume together. It's just a beautiful, it's something super simple that you can do. Yeah. It might confuse the Eucharistic minister, but just hold your ground. Like, just, I mean, yeah, just, yeah, they'll, just wait, they'll get right it. There. They'll yeah. understand. Like, yeah. I mean, you're not walking away with it. Like, yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, you're just standing there. Like, yeah. Um, but uh, that's just something else that you can consider doing if, if you okay. want to try that with your, with your spouse. It's just beautiful. I love that. Yeah. That's beautiful. So speaking of you saying like going into confession and stuff, we had a, the same priest who started doing that in Louisiana. Um, who was ultimately the priest who confirmed my husband um, this past year, which was awesome. But he, um, <laughs> I would go to confession and I'd be like, struggling with this and I'm struggling with this. And he would, <laughs> he would always say like, you need to lean into the marital graces. And I was like, okay. And then I'd go say my penance. Well, finally, after a couple of times, I was like, what does that mean? And he was like, go home and have sex with your husband, Heather. And I was like, what? And that's when he was like, the graces that flow from that, he was like, that is the reaffirming of that sacrament. Like it's a living sacrament. It doesn't, it, it doesn't happen once. And so he's mm -hmm. like, graces flow from that. Just like graces flow every time you go into that confessional, graces flow every time that you receive the Eucharist, you know, and he said, graces flow every time you consummate your marriage. And if your marriage is struggling, you should go do it more you know? Yep. And, and yep. so I told my husband that a few days ago and he was like, I always knew I liked him. <laughs> okay. I had a very similar experience. I went on a retreat recently and had confession with this priest that I had never met before. And he legitimately was like, well, I think you just need to have a lot of sex with your husband. And if, if kids come, kids come. And I told my husband this, he's like, Who's that guy? Let's Who's go that to him. guy? Yeah. <laughs> I need to go to that one. Okay. So there's another question then. If if you're ready to move on. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Ahead. So, um, so we are no longer able to have children. We have things that happened in the past that are, I would love for miracles to happen, but it's just not. So it's, it's very hard. I feel like I, I struggle a lot talking about NFP because we tried and failed at NFP multiple times. Um, and now we're unable. So yeah. I don't want to talk to women who are carrying this cross. Um, I don't, I, it's, I struggle to talk to people who struggle with conception because like, I'm a kind of fertile mortal over here until this stuff. But then I, I struggle with speaking with women who are, are carrying the burden of NFP because I, I don't have that burden. And mm -hmm. I, I pray to God every day for some miracle to happen and he hasn't chosen us for that yet. So um, this is something that I struggle speaking on because I don't want to be a hypocrite. You know what I mean? Like this is not something I struggle with. Um, mm -hmm. But somebody said, help me understand this teaching. NFP touts efficacy rates of 93 to 98% in typical use while condoms are barely above 80. If the intention in any method is to have sex in such a way as to not get pregnant, and either case would willingly and happily have have any baby conceived. What is the difference? The church says sex should be unitive and procreative, and I don't see how having sex during a woman's infertile window fulfills that. Maybe this is two questions. Thank you. I think it's yeah. I think it's about five questions. Um, yep. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's quite no, a few no, no. questions. This is this is good. Let's just um, we'll go through a little bit of this like NFP basics. What the okay, church yeah. teaches on this this unitive and procreative aspect and this Major. is if if you want to dive into this more the um, encyclical humana vitae is okay. fabulous Making it's also notes. short like okay it's beautiful and short um and fairly accessible like it's not crazy heady like if you try to okay. go read you know whatever <laughs> yeah if you try to read Cassie Kanubi that one's not nearly as like accessible, accessible. although it says okay. the exact same things okay. um okay but Unity and procreation. These mm -hmm. two, these are the two inseparable meanings of sex, the inseparable like purposes of sex. Yes. Um, unity being this both this physical as well as this spiritual unity. Mm -hmm. There is a physical unity that happens. The man is inside of the woman. Yeah. There is a spiritual unity that happens of just there's this chemical unity, but then there's also just this the spiritual level that we can't even comprehend, right? Mm -hmm. Those marital graces that you mentioned. Yeah. And then we have procreation, which is, you know, making babies, right? Um, one of the things that Pope Paul VI, who wrote Humana Vitae, what he says in there is it's like it can't it like basically it can't be argued. Like if you just look at sex and like what it is and what the two humans do when they come together. Like it can't be argued that it is deeply unitive and that it makes babies. Like yeah. that's just what it's made for. Right. Okay. So knowing that we understand that like we as humans cannot, we can't get in the way of that. We, mm -hmm. we can't, that's how it's designed. Yeah. Now, something else that is how it's designed is that a woman's body goes through fertile and infertile phases throughout the cycle. Mm -hmm. It's that is how God designed our bodies. Mm -hmm. because of that, because God designed us to not just be fertile all the, all time, the time, we know that not every single act of marital intercourse is going to result in a baby. We, we know, you, we, we know that it's know impossible. That. Mm -hmm. It's impossible for every single act of marital intercourse to result in a baby. Now, mm -hmm. maybe that's not true for you and your spouse. You're like, literally every time we run sex, <laughs> <I'm a baby." laughs> no, not that. Um, no, we, we do it more than that, but you know, <laughs> right. Might not feel that way. Exactly, yeah. But like, let's talk about, okay, if if every act was supposed to result in a child, that would mean that we would need to use NFP in order to find that fertile window and only and have sex only, during that fertile yes. window. Which and is, then you would not, you it would not be permissible to have sex while you're pregnant. Oh. And that's not true. That's not true. It's, it's actually like, extremely lie, beneficial yeah. to do it. <laughs> it's, it's actually very through, right? beneficial, yeah. But when you're pregnant, it is impossible to create another child. Now, somebody's mm -hmm. probably going to at you and be like, but there was that one person in like- Who had two uteruses. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, what they don't talk about in that situation is that there were IVF meds, which meant that there were multiple, um, she she didn't realize that she had gotten pregnant and her she was forcing her body to continue to ovulate. 
So she had an ovulation that was medically induced um, about two months after she got yeah, pregnant. Yeah, yeah. So that okay. is why there were like those two babies. If you mm-hmm. don't know if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were babies born that were like two months different Apart. age. Yeah. Um so anyway, <laughs> that's not natural. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's not how the the woman's body is is designed to work. Um, okay, so because these two things, this unity and this procreation are inseparable, mm-hmm. we cannot, we can't separate with them. We cannot take them apart. And when something like contraception is used, we're trying to have that unity part without that procreative part. And here's mm-hmm. the thing is when you, because they're inseparable, if you try, try to take the procreation away, you take the unity away too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about a condom. Yeah. A condom takes away both. Yeah. Because you are putting a physical barrier yeah. between husband and wife. Their the physical unity is broken. Is not, yeah. And that procreative possibility is gone. Yeah. Like, I mean, maybe not totally gone. They're only like 80% yeah. effective. And also, like they're probably way less effective than that because that is uh studies are done throughout the female fertility cycle, not just during the fertile window. So yeah. the actual efficacy of condoms is probably way lower than that 79%. Yeah. Because like if you use them just during the fertile window, they're probably only like 60, maybe even less. Interesting. Um so anyway, super not effective. Yeah. <laughs> but so the difference is. That we are using something that God designed. We're using the female fertility cycle in NFP. And we're using our knowledge Mm -hmm. and our reason and our will as humans to look at signs that are present throughout the female fertility cycle Mm -hmm. and identify that fertile and infertile window. And then we are prayer. Here's the thing with NFP. You have to have discernment alongside NFP. You need to be prayerfully considering whether you should be avoiding right now or not. And I Mm -hmm. think that's something that is missed a lot in NFP instruction is like, we're all about the efficacy of like, it's, it's this effective, but then it just becomes this like tool, you know, Uh, okay. Another mm -hmm. tool, right. And if you don't use that tool alongside a deep intimate relationship with God, then how do you know? How do you know? How do you know what God's calling to you? you yeah. two right now, right? Yeah. I had somebody message me on Instagram once and they were just like, oh, we're, we're avoiding right now because of X, Y, Z, but like, I just really, really want a baby. And so I'm like, I'm trying to figure out like, if, you know, if, if that want is coming from God and I'm like, yes, the want to have a baby is always coming from God. God will never not want you to have a baby. Yeah, I promise you because yeah. God is the creator and he yeah. loves that we can create. He created us to create, right? Yeah. But God also might be, you know, calling you to something else at the same time. So like that desire to have a baby, it's always going to come from God. Like Satan's never going to desire you to have a baby. I can guarantee you that. Like he is the destroyer. Mm -hmm. He is the twister. Like Mm -hmm. he doesn't like creation. The fact that we can create, he hates it. He hates it because he he doesn't have the ability to create. He can't create. Um, Anyway, sorry, tangent. (laughs) No, no, I love it. I'm loving this conversation. Um, yeah, so we're, we're using that prayer and discernment and then we're utilizing those fertile and infertile windows within the fertility cycle. Now, let me, again, I'm going to give like one more argument to like why, again, our NFP is absolutely licit. Like, cause this, I get asked this question a ton. What is the difference between contraception and NFP? If you don't want to have a baby, like the results, the same. Something that Christopher West says actually is he's like, oh, okay, well, let's talk about grandma. Grandma's going to probably die in about three months. What's the difference between just killing her now or just waiting for her to die? Yeah. I think that's a little graphic, but it's kind of the same point. What's the difference of cutting off the procreative possibility or just trying to work with God's design and not have a baby? So one is is playing God. Yep. And one is cooperating with God's design. Exactly. And and that's like, and and I I see that like the unitive, like when we were like using contraception and everything early in marriage, like that unitive part of marriage of this of being together, like I could feel that, right? Like yeah. it, you know, when when women do it before marriage and they're using contraception or whatever, you it feel more more like use. 
like you're being used for something. Then this unitive thing that I've found in marriage in growing in this area. Yeah, and so how the second says the opposite of love is not hate, it's use. Oh, yeah. Right. That's good. So when we when you're using another person, sex is supposed to be this ultimate gift of self. You're never yeah. supposed to use sex. Yeah, you're never, never supposed to. to use the other person, right? Yeah. You receive the gift of the other person and you give yourself. Yes. And in receiving the gift of the other person, you gain ultimate pleasure, right? Yeah. That all comes from receiving. And it's like ultimate trust too. It takes uh, it takes so much trust to give yourself to that person wholly and completely. And then to recognize that they're wholly and completely trusting you, right? To give themselves to you. Like when 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 that gravity of that like hits you, then like it, it kind of makes me go like, why wouldn't we want to do this all the time? You know what I mean? Like exactly, exactly. <laughs> I've got I've got this podcast episode like cooking in my brain. It's been there for like a year, and I just haven't quite haven't quite gotten it like sorted out yet. But it's mm -hmm. just like basically, sex is so good that you should always want to do it because yeah. it's true. Like that's so true. <laughs> it's true. It's true, and it's good. And like you know, um, you know, somebody will say like, oh, what? Oh, what was this one? Um, somebody asked this question and this is what I was going to ask you. Um, <laughs> okay, so we got two. Three even. Um, how can you... F no, we already did that. Oh, no. Someone said, how can you foster intimacy at this stage of life um, with young children? Mom... She's the mom. She does bedtime all by herself and is pretty much the preferred parent. By the time I get bedtime done, my husband is either asleep or he wants to have sex immediately. As soon as I get out of my toddler's bedroom, I'm touched out and not in a frame of mind to jump into bed after having a toddler all over me, which he struggles to understand. Um, and then another one says, how can I not feel like an object of pleasure when being intimate for him, even though I'm not necessarily into it? And I think you kind of are, well, one, I so, screamed yeah. the, you I mean, need to communicate. Feel, yeah. But also the to... stress. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. I mean, for the, for that first question of like, you know, I feel totally touched out. I'm the preferred parent. You have got you and your spouse have got to find things that he can take off of your plate. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you, if you have to do bedtime, I get it. I know, I know that struggle, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. you are the one the kid wants and that's fine, mm -hmm. but that means your husband needs to do the dishes and he needs to do all the cleanup that you were also doing earlier. Or he needs to be the one to cook dinner that night, or he needs to pick it up on his way home. Which boils like, down to com communication, right? That all boils down to communication. And if you're like, we don't have money for that. Okay. Well, if you want, you, again, we're talking about prioritizing your marriage. Mm -hmm. That pizza that he picks up on the way home that costs $20, that's not you being lazy and like spending extra money on, on food that you could have cooked. That's you investing money in your marriage. Yeah. Like, that's you putting that priority toward taking some things off of your plate so that you have that interest in having sex. Okay. Now, maybe you're the preferred parent for bedtime, but are there things in bedtime that your husband can do? Okay. Yeah. Maybe you're the one who needs to read the stories and give the final kiss goodnight, but can he get everybody dressed and bathed and teeth brushed? Mm -hmm. Right. Or is there some kind of a trade-off that you can do? Maybe you have two or three kids, right? Can can you focus on one for one aspect and he focus on the the other two for the and we you kind of do a yeah. trade around, right? Yeah. How can your husband take things off of your plate? Because if you're doing bedtime and he's laying in bed, he's getting a great amount of rest and you're not. Right? And he's so ready he's to go. He's getting in the mood for <laughs> sex and you're not. Yeah. And that has to be communicated. If your husband can't understand that, then you need to go out on a date night bring a notebook with you and just like work through it. Work Give yourself a things. couple of hours and yeah. like talk about the struggles and the differences. Yeah. What was that second question? Cause I okay. had a thought on that. How, one too. Do, how can I not feel like an object for pleasure when oh. being intimate, even though I'm not for him, even though I'm not necessarily into it. I read something a little while ago that just, I think was so beautiful. And it was a book I won't recommend because it's a little out of was I read a lot of secular stuff, but I thought it was awesome. <laughs> we have to trust our husband's desire. Okay. 
His desire comes from a good place. His desire comes from the Lord. Every desire that we have comes from the Lord. Now, it might be aimed not in a good spot, but if you can recognize that like his desire truly does come from a good place, Mm -hmm. then you can start to reframe and, and trust your husband that he isn't using you. And, and that doesn't mean you always have to say yes to sex. And that doesn't mean you have to say yes to anything that feels directly like use. If there's something he does during sex that you're like, this feels like use, tell him you don't want to do that thing. Right. Yeah. But ultimately that, like that desire that he has to have sex. And like, we kind of talked about this earlier with like, he wants to have sex when I'm totally stressed out and doesn't make any sense. That desire is coming from a good place. And sometimes it's coming from a totally subconscious place too. Yeah. Like, so trust your husband. Like you married this guy, you know, this guy, you know, he's not a total jerk. Yeah. Right. Like, and if he is a total jerk, then like that means marriage counseling. Like, let's yeah, like we gotta lay, get to the root of that, out, right? Like, yeah. Then let's get to the root of that, right? But like your husband is not an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> Trust him. Yeah. Trust him. I would even say, like, reading that, something that came to mind too is I like prior to marriage had um like sexual trauma. And I would also say that something like that screams to me that you need to look into your own past and why you associate sex with use. Um, yes, absolutely, um, absolutely. And maybe even associating anything new with use too. You know what I mean? Like different things you might try, like you can even say that hesitantly, like, hey, I'm like nervous to do like position or what you know whatever it is Mm -hmm. um but I trust you and like I just need to be open with you that if I don't like this I'll let you know and I trust that you'll stop you know like or whatever it is um but that's like that's kind of what screamed in my head for that was like um one we need to address like women like not being into it and the stress issue but then even uncovering that is like like God made sex good for both of you, mm-hmm. you know? And like, if you are ending, if you're ending sex, feeling like you've been used, then there's really deeper things that you need to like uncover either in couples therapy, in your marriage and what's going on in the bed or in your own self and what you equate this Absolutely. pleasure with. Like, like if you had this yeah. um, promiscuous past, and then shame that accompanies that promiscu- promiscuity, um, that's hard to shake when you get married. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you enjoyed it, and then all of a sudden you have this conversion, and sex is supposed to be good, and and you're not, and you're learning, and you're trying to do it within the, the boundaries God has created and given us, but then you feel that pleasure again, your brain goes, wait a minute, but that pleasure was bad. That was not, I was not supposed mm-hmm. to be doing that. And you get this guilt and the shame, and that can feel like, that guilt and shame can feel like use when in reality, it could just be that you are, you need to disconnect the wires and reconnect them the right way. Like the way that God intended it to be. Um, Scripts are really helpful for this and just okay. some mindset work Yeah. of, you know, just every single morning, get like write out a couple sentence script about how good sex is, how good sexual pleasure is, how holy it is. Mm-hmm. Like, and created um, by the lord like yeah say it existed before the fall (laughs) exactly right and like adam and eve yeah we know that adam adam and eve came together while maintaining their virginal value which mm, that's a whole that's a whole thing but Mm -hmm. they had that unity they Mm -hmm. did and it was fertile, even though a kid didn't come from it, because all of these things have both a physical, like the biologic only informs the theologic. Mm-hmm. Like, so, you know, Adam and Eve had sex before the fall. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's our takeaway statement. That's the takeaway. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So one last thing on like NFP stuff, and this is regards to people who um, maybe had a tubal ligation who, um, and I think he, I mean, honestly, you probably answered this, um, with the comment about like, well, that would mean that pregnancy sex during pregnancy is off limits. Um, but tubal ligation, 
um, hysterectomies, and let's say the man had a vasectomy. Um, how do you navigate that if if it's not if we have stood in the way of procreation in some way, shape, or form? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is con- confession. Like, make yeah. sure that you and your husband have both, yeah. conf- both of you, even if it was only on one side. You yeah. both need the grace that confession brings. Yeah. Um. The the church does not say that you are obligated to pursue a, a or... reversal if that's possible, but I I encourage you to bring that to prayer because that mm-hmm. may be part of what you need for yeah. your healing of this. Yeah. Um, because, because you have, you've stood in the way of procreation. You have played God you've in a way of, trying yeah. to, of, of, you know, trying to take away this procreative aspect. Yeah. Um, now as far as like now, okay, you have confessed it. Mm-hmm. Maybe you've sought out reversal and it's just not possible for you or, um, or, or whatever. Yeah. Or maybe you have a hysterectomy, so that's not possible. Yeah. Um, Okay, so now you have to rely on the sacraments. You have to rely on God's grace. Your marriage is still fertile. Mm-hmm. It is still fertile, even though you do not have fertile possibility anymore. You don't have yeah. procreative possibility anymore. Um, and so you have to rely on the um, the spiritual fertility mm-hmm. of your marriage now in so how is God calling you to live out that fertility? And the Does that, that mean, yeah, and the fruitfulness of that. Does that mean actually adopting more children? Does that mean um, more kind of spiritually adopting mm-hmm. children? Does that mean maybe maybe you start working in baptism ministry and spiritually adopting all of those yeah. children, or you start working in Or maybe in you RCIA, use that as fruit right? to to instruct young couples on avoiding yes. the things that you have done. I don't know if you've ever met or listened to Mary Lenneberg. Do you know who she oh, is? Oh, yes. Yeah, Okay. I do. She's lovely. Um, and, you know, they talk about this, that she had her mm-hmm. tubes tied. And and she speaks openly about it. And they, her and Jerry always say, like, our entire life should be a script of don't do what we did. You know? Yes, and, exactly. And, um... And I love that because like you can speak up and say like, hey, we did this. You know, I've I've known some women who have kind of haphazardly gotten hysterectomies because they just believed what their doctor said. And then they, mm-hmm. they come out a few years later and realize I probably didn't need that hysterectomy, but now there's no chance at this and they're heartbroken about it. And, and there's a way to say like, there's fruit that can still come from that. Right. Um, yeah. And and so to say that, like, not to mention, I also know someone who's. Um, what is it called? The vasectomy failed, you know, yeah. so. So you, you can know, always pray for a miracle. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, I well, and just always pray for will. God's will. Like if God wills yeah. that miracle, he will. And if he doesn't, then he'll also give you the grace to to carry the burden of the cross that you sterilized yourself. He absolutely exactly. will give you that grace because he knows the, he knows the choices where, you know, like, and he honors us and our ability to make the choices. But he, as soon as we surrender that to him, like, Hey, I messed up and we admit it like graces flow from that running back to the father, even if you can't reverse it or what, whatever the circumstances may be. Um, but I, I, I think, think one that of the most mm-hmm. important things when it comes to something like this, like if you have you know, actively chosen to mm-hmm. sterilize yourself in some way or, or your spouse Yeah, is you go to the sacrament of compassion. And if you, you know, openly bring that to the Lord and you place it at his feet, he forgives you and it is wiped away. Yeah. But if you don't forgive yourself, you are not trusting in God's grace. Yes. You are basically flipping God off if you do not forgive yourself. You're not saying that he's all powerful and all forgiving yep. and all, you know what I mean? You're not believing it truly. You you have to trust in the grace of God. And so that might mean you might be going to confession every single month for the same thing month after month, not necessarily confessing the act of it, 
but lack of forgiveness that the lack of forgiveness for yourself. So I don't even, this ties into another question. So it says, how can I let go of past sexual sins? I've been to confession and stopped, but I'm still filled with regret and feel like it impacts my current married together life. Um, and I think this is the exact same thing. Um, I was at, I can't even remember like the context or who the priest was, but he basically came from the Vatican and he brought like 350 relics or something. And he had all these relics in the gym of our church school. And um, we were able to go venerate them. And he was telling us all these stories and like the main point of his story, what, and I think most of the room was sobbing afterwards was he was like, like, raise your hand if you go to confession. And, we, you know, people are raising their hands. And he's like, he looks at the at our priest and he's like, okay, you're doing a good job. Like, they're going to confession. And he's like, raise your hand if you still struggle with guilt after you've confessed things. And people, like, raise their hand. And he was like, you have got to forgive yourself. And the whole room just, like, lost it. Because it's so true. I did a podcast episode called Forgive and Forget. And there was basically a... a priest that we knew had told people that like forgiving and forgetting is only possible if you're God. Like God forgives and wipes away our sins. Us as humans, if we if we just quote forgive and forget, it's um you're kind you could be setting yourself up for abuse, you know, because you still need to have remembrance of like, okay, this person did hurt me before or whatever it is. But to forgive yourself you need to be united with God in that because with true faith in God, you believe that he really does forgive my sins. So no matter what I did in the past, if I honestly confess them and I laid them at the cross, do I not think that the cross can overcome that? Mm -hmm. And if I don't, then I won't exactly. forgive myself. And so that was, that was huge for me because then the next day I didn't think I needed to go to confession, you know, like I had gone a couple weeks before and that next day I sobbed my face off and he was mm -hmm. like, what do you not forgive yourself for? And like, whoo, years and years of stuff. And it's like, we hold on to so much of that and it's lack of faith, you know, like that's really exactly. what it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. So good. So the, so yeah, the on, on that question of, uh, you know, I've had a sexual past, like, how mm -hmm. do I not let this influence, um, my own current married sexual life. Mm -hmm. Um, I would definitely, um, ask for the intercession of Mary Magdalene for sure. Okay. Um, because she lived, she lived that mm -hmm. <laughs> she had a sexual past. Um, but then, you know, through God's grace, was able to live beyond that sexual past, right? Mm -hmm. Into into beautiful a beautiful life of purity. And yeah. I don't mean purity in that she didn't get married. I mean purity of heart. Like and yeah. that's what you're called to. You're called to purity of heart within your marriage mm -hmm. while you have sex, right? Purity yeah. of heart. Um but then like beyond that more practically, like like have you gone to a good Catholic therapist about these issues? Mm -hmm. um, you may need to work through them in a more kind of concrete way rather than yeah. simply like your, your journey of healing may involve that. Um, yeah. And I think sometimes too, sometimes our journey of healing requires reparation on our part. Mm -hmm. um, so that might maybe, maybe part of your journey is reaching out to some of those people and apologizing mm -hmm. for how you both acted and, and, yeah. you know, and, and what you did together. Right. Yeah. Maybe it doesn't like maybe reaching out to those people would make things worse. I'm not like, I'm not saying you have to do that. Right. But like that might be part of that healing journey yeah. for you as well. Um, and then beyond that, I think what you are struggling with is this person who asked this kind of question of like, I've had the sexual past and now it's influencing me. What you need to reconcile is that sex is good. Mm. One of the things I like to say is that sex isn't bad before marriage and good after marriage. Mm -hmm. Sex is good. Sex yeah. is holy. It's always good and holy. But outside of marriage, sex is not in its like designed state. Yeah, it's disordered. So it's disordered, right? It's been twisted. So like 
and and it's it's not possible it's it's literally not possible outside of marriage for sex to be what it was designed to be so think about like a seminarian and a priest a seminarian is very close like maybe even like a trans let's say like transitional deacon like he's very close to becoming a priest right mm -hmm. he is going to practice saying the mass He's going to practice the way that his hands need to move. He is going to practice saying the words. He will never be able to consecrate the Eucharist until he has been consecrated, right? Yeah. Until mm -hmm. he has been ordained. Yeah. It is impossible for a transitional deacon yeah. to say the mass, right? But yeah. he's going to practice it. Yeah, it, it can look the same. It can sound the same. It can feel the same. Exactly. But if it's if it's not gone through the sacrament, then it's not ordained by God and therefore does not have the graces that flow from it. It's an exactly. incomplete, so that's the it's same, the incomplete that's the same version. For sex. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the incomplete version, right? It's not possible for sex outside of marriage to be what sex actually is, to be that unitive and procreative yeah. act. Like, yeah, it might still create a baby. Yeah, it might still chemically bond you together, but there is a spiritual aspect of it that is absolutely missing from it. And so it is, yeah. it is not the fullness um, and it's in not a lot that of ways, fully it giving, fully receiving. Isn't, yeah. Yeah. It isn't sex. Like in a lot of ways, it's, it's just this twisted mockery of yeah. what sex is. And so, you know, just really thinking about that, praying with that, um, maybe, you know, reading some books like, uh, Holy Sex by Dr. Gregory Podcack. Yeah. Um, or I'm thinking, uh, like theology, the body for beginners by mm -hmm. Christopher West is a good one. Um, good news about sex and marriage by Christopher West, like okay, filling yeah. your brain with the good news about sex. goodness, yeah. with the sex like, gospel, like the good news exactly, about it, you know, <laughs> exactly. And if you're, if, you know, if, if you have a background in philosophy at all, if you've taken theology courses before, like, yeah, go ahead, dive into theology, of the body, um, if you haven't, I like, I really recommend like read some books on theology of the body yeah, yeah. before you try to dive into the text. Cause the te it, it's overwhelming. It's big. Yes. It's, yeah. That's massive. Yeah. Um, okay. I have one last one. Um, someone said when I first converted, I immediately thought I had to give up anything pleasurable in sex. Can you elaborate the things that are illicit? Because my husband thinks that now that I have converted Catholic sex is boring. Cool. Um, <laughs> cool. And Catholic what I thought to that boring. is Catholic sex is not boring. Uninformed Catholic sex is boring. That is, that is Absolutely. what I thought. I was like, okay, okay. I see yeah. this. Yeah. Well, I think first off, like those, those podcast episodes I mentioned earlier, um, that's just a really good kind of like plain and simple, like here's what the church teaches on these things. And we dive okay, in, good. um, kind of deep into some of those. So that might be helpful, but, okay, I'll tag um, those. okay, look, plain, super plain and simple is the man's orgasm, his ejaculation has to happen inside of the woman Bingo. because that is allowing for the possibility of procreation. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, you're pretty much good to go. Yeah. Um, again, like, the, so no, no part of the body is untouchable or unkissable. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that says that anything is bad or dirty, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the um, I, I typically caution things like hand jobs for the man and blow jobs for the man because you can accidentally go too far and then the mm -hmm. man does not orgasm inside yeah. of the woman. He does not ejaculate inside of the woman. Um, that, that seed, that pro procreative possibility needs to be placed where it's supposed to go. <laughs> Yeah. And otherwise, we don't. So have let's that say there's an accident. Do you say that needs to be confessed? Um. Okay. Technically, no. But you probably should take yeah. it. To, you probably should yeah. take it to confession to help yourself because you're not going to be able to forgive yourself without the grace of God. Exactly. Like, yeah. You just aren't. Yeah. Even because it, it wasn't was in accident. full knowledge, right? So like, because here's the thing: is like when we're evaluating a moral action, there's three parts to evaluating a moral action. Okay. And there's something called, um, you know, the like double effect, mm -hmm. And, and that is at play here in an accidental ejaculation outside of the woman mm -hmm. is that 
there is raw there is a twisting of the natural order there is wrong there mm -hmm. right there is missing of the mark but it but because of the accident you aren't morally culpable for it however yeah. it still affects your soul yeah okay so you might not be morally culpable for it but it still has a there is but it still has a fact mm -hmm. and you need God's grace to be able to heal that effect. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. like, it te like technically, no, you don't need to take that confession, but I really, inc you, you need to, or a more on a different level of like, you need to take that to God and say, help me understand yes. this, like, and help me, help me figure this yeah. out. So right? what I was thinking is like, let's say a child goes into a grocery store and is playing with like a little toy. And then walks out of the store and you get in the car and you realize the kid still has the toy. And you're and they're like, oh my gosh, mom, I have this toy in my hand. And you go, oh my gosh, that, that's not a sin. You didn't mean to do it, but you still need to walk back in that store and return it. Like you there, still have still to, wrong. there's still done, wrong right? that was done, even if it was unintentional. Um, and it still affects. So like, let's say, you know, the, the kid accidentally walking out of the store with a toy, right? There's, there's, there's no wrong there. He didn't really know what he was doing. But if you don't like reconcile that, then there is it wrong. is affecting there it is affecting his soul because it was so easy for him to walk out of the store with that toy. Mm -hmm. Now he knows how easy it was for him to walk out of the store. Even if it is reconciled, it has still affected his person. Yeah. Right. And like he's not morally culpable for it. However, he now knows how easy it is to walk out of a store with something. It is mm -hmm. going to be that much easier for him in the future mm -hmm. to steal something. Yeah. Just, just out of, that's the, that's, that's, uh, and it's called double damned, which means like, he doesn't know it was wrong, but it is still affecting him and it's still twisting his soul. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's what's happening when those accidents happen. It's, it's like, there's no moral culpability there. Mm -hmm. but it's still affecting your soul. You know, you know how to get there. You know how to do that next time. You know how good it felt like, right. And, and it can subconsciously twist something. So you have to mm -hmm. bring that to God. You have to reconcile it as much as you can um, and keep learning, but also yeah. like, please don't let that like make you freeze in like trying to learn how to engage in sexual pleasure. Like, again, it is an accident. You are not morally culpable for it, yeah. but just bring it to confession like yeah just do it like yeah bring it back. this this was awesome I had to for an hour and like 30 minutes so I apologize so just tell everybody where they can find you and can you talk a little bit about your o course absolutely yeah so <laughs> okay. um, the the easiest places to find me on Instagram at charting toward intimacy no s on toward um, and then I, so I have the podcast, obviously that's, um, a, a great place to find information, but I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I have, um, some courses, some NFP related courses. Um, and then I also have, uh, my newest course, actually, it's not my newest course. It's my second newest course, um, is called the orgasm course for Catholic women. And we just do a in-depth dive into what sexual pleasure is and how to get it. And what kind of things you and your spouse need to like work on and experiment with and try out um, in order to get you to sexual pleasure, um, but also kind of integrating all of that theological goodness of like sexual That's pleasure awesome. is important. It's worth searching for. It's worth yeah. getting. Yeah. Um, and maintaining. Yeah, is, that, like mm -hmm. it shouldn't. You know, have you ever heard that thing where people say every time you have sex for the first year of your marriage, put a bean in a jar and then every time you do it after the first year of marriage, take it out and you'll never finish the beans or something like, you know, like there's some oh, dumb say, sad. and I'm like, that's sad. <laughs> Wait a minute. That, that's would not be, that would not be true for my, <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Yeah. So no, not that old, like everybody's old and rusty situation. Terrible. Like, no, it should that's be getting terrible. better with age, like a good wine. Everything should be getting yeah. better with age. Yeah. Um, and is your podcast charting toward int intimacy also? Okay, cool. And I'll link that. And then I will link the O course too, which is super exciting. And um, the O course is in the giveaway that I mentioned in the beginning of the show in the little yeah. intro. Um, so that was super exciting. Um, yeah, speaking of the stress thing, one thing we did that was really good is we took a online class 
it's like like yours you know like it's evergreen kind of thing like you just watch the videos it's not live or anything and um it's like this Australian or New Zealand couple and he's a professional massage therapist and he teaches you how to massage your spouse but like in like a romantic way but not like a raunchy way like there's nothing x-rated sounds awesome I should check that out it's really cool it's like $59 for (laughs) two months maybe something like that and so I got it for Christmas for us for last year and it was great because he kind of goes into like the basics of like getting an oil base and like even things like that but he also shows you how to massage in a way that like he's like doing it on a bed is not smart because there's nowhere for you to put your head like in a hole. Yeah, like oh my a, gosh. And so you can get cricks in your neck. by your pillow. Yeah, exactly. And so he teach it. He has a hand foot, hand, heads and head and feet, like little module. And so he actually teaches you how to massage your spouse's feet while you're sitting on the same couch. That way, like you can be watching a show and it's great because it allows me to relax, which then helps put me in the mood. Because if I'm not relaxed, mm-hmm. I can't just turn it on, you know. But if we're watching a TV show and he just starts rubbing my feet, which now it comes with like a rhythm. Like they, they literally have like a printout that's like start here, rub here, do C's here, whatever. Yeah. And so it's great. And it was wonderful because we would like watch a class. It was like 10 minutes. And then we'd like try it on each other. It was lovely. So that's also included in the giveaway too. And I was like, this is like people need this stuff. Sounds amazing. I Nobody wants to talk about sex and intimacy. And I'm like, y'all, everybody's marriage needs this. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. I will put all the links to everything. Um, and thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. Okay, guys, here I am. I'm trying to finish up this podcast. I have to put in all these ads. I'm trying to like be better at this. <laughs> so I've got all the links in the show notes. The giveaway is in the show notes. You can also find it on my Instagram page and my link um, in my bio. Make sure you go enter that. We have a interview with a moral theologian. I'm doing that in a few days and it's going to post later in February. So if you have any questions about your marriage and NFP, fertility treatments, anything that you would want to ask a married moral theologian who is a woman, make sure you go to the link that's in the show notes also because I have an anonymous question box that you can ask her, Dr. Sarah, any questions you want. So check the link in the bio for anything um, that was mentioned in the show and how to find Ellen and how to enter the giveaway, all those things. Make sure you support the affiliates because then that supports the pod. So Coco New and Mentionables. And I will see y'all next time.